Welcome to ESMO 2016. I'm here with Practice Update. My name is Monty Pell, and I'm a medical oncologist at the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm here with my great friend and colleague, Dr. Tony Chueri from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, the director of the GU Oncology Program there. Tony, it's such a thrill to have you with us. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me, Monty. Absolutely. Well, Tony, I wanted to ask you, you're, you're the star of this meeting, quite clearly. You're presenting results from the Cabo Sun clinical trial. I know that the data is not going to be released until the session tomorrow, but tell us some of the rationale for pitting sunitinib against cabozantinib. Well, Monty, I think this is an amazing unmet need. And the National Cancer Institute and the Alliance, the GU committee, under the leadership at that time of Eric Small and now Michael Morris, did recognize this important unmet need, the intermediate and poorest population. So, you know, we teamed up with the NCI and other, and one of the unmet needs was in frontline untreated patient, can you do more than VEGF receptor blockade? Uh, and sunitinib, as you know, is the most commonly used and highly effective drugs frontline. So we had cabozentinib in mind because one of the biology about cabozentinib is that the drug not only inhibits the VEGF receptor, but does inhibit other tyrosine kinases, such as MET and XL. And these, we know now, are involved in mechanism of resistance and escape to VEGF receptor inhibitor. There is a significant preclinical data. And at that time, there was a, a trial that showed cabocentinib is active in later line of treatment. So we launched this study. It's a smaller study, a randomized phase two, but well powered for the primary endpoint of uh, progression-free survival. In a population of metastatic RCC of unmet need, which is 70 to 80% of everyone, this is the population of intermediate and poor risk renal cell cancer. Well, you know, I would imagine that this study is going to have a dramatic impact on how we think about frontline therapy. But one interesting conundrum that I see is that many of the frontline trials that we have designed right now pit sunitinib against Correct. a combination of either IO and VEGF inhibitor or two IOs together. What are your thoughts there? Should we be looking at combinations with cabozantinib now? I think it's very possible we should uh, because the field is moving very, very fast. And uh, there is data, there is also preclinical data, not just that cabozentinib work and the IO work, so the combination should work, which, is, which makes sense. Yeah. But also there is a preclinical data of synergy uh, with cabozentinib on the immune system. There is a decrease in the Tregs, which impair the immune uh, response, and there's an increase in CD8 T cell. So together they make more sense also uh, rather than just the clinically, but they make more sense uh, biology-wise. Got it, got it. Now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and ask you about another hot topic at this meeting, which is adjuvant therapy mm -hmm. for renal cell carcinoma. First time that we're gonna see some positive data from an adjuvant trial in the s -Track study. Now, I'm gonna ask you a question, not knowing the data associated with the trial, about whether or not disease-free survival is a relevant endpoint in this setting, or should we be setting the bar higher to overall survival? I know I it's mean, a common concept in oncology. I mean, what do this you think? is a, a great question. I think when the study were designed, disease for survival is an acceptable endpoint uh, that would not take many, many years to happen based on events. Uh, but, but this is a tough, tough, uh, you know, area. And I would say it's going to be beside the combination and what the front line going to show or new target going to be an area the next six to twelve months of intense discussion among experts. Because we do have a study, a co another cooperative group study with Dr. Naomi Haas from ECOG, we all participated in, uh, where the study was completely negative, even on subgroup analysis in high-risk patient, which is what ASTRAC is, there was no difference in disease-free survival or overall survival. So we need to see the data. Uh, I would be certainly more convinced if the toxicity was acceptable mm -hmm. and if there at least a trend in overall survival. Uh, you know, because at the end of the day, with surgery alone, you can cure these patients. Great point. You know, so should we, you know, delaying progression, um, is that something that, because remember, this is not versus delayed sunitinib. We don't know what happens to the placebo arm. So delaying progression, is that acceptable if there is no overall survival and let's say decreased quality of life? Remain to be seen, but let's not forget 
that we, with surgery alone, we can cure patients. So we need to look at the study. It's definitely could be practice changes, but it has to be taken, you know, um, it has to take in account the Assure trial. And of course, there are two studies um, in the adjuvant setting that finished accrual okay. with, bazo with bazopinib and another with sorafenib. Uh, so if these two studies are negative, let's say, then what is going on? We have to ask ourselves. So look forward to seeing the data. I think that's a very pragmatic approach to this question of adjuvant therapy. And Anajit Chwari, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's always Mark. a pleasure to get your insights. Pleasure is mine. Thank you.